my mother. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Arthur Rance McNally and welcome to the fourth uh, Bigfoot Green Room table read. Tonight we're going to be reading a TV pilot by Heather Pilder Olson titled 38 Minutes. Uh, I'd like to, my name is, well, I should introduce myself. I'm Arthur Rance McNally. I am one of the co-leads of the Bigfoot Green Room, which is a one-year uh, writing fellowship uh, where we work out and try to make a gauntlet for your ideas. Uh, we're open for applications starting in December. So look for that at, at the Bigfoot screen contest, script contest. Um, so, but before we go any farther, let's introduce uh, Heather Pilder Olson. Uh, Heather has written, produced, and directed mm -hmm. several award-winning films and is currently uh, producing the documentary, The River. She, is, she was an associate producer for the documentary, Gold Balls, which premiered at the Seattle International Film Festival in 2016 and was screened on PBS in 2020. She wrote the teleplay for Crack the Whip, which was selected for the Bigfoot Script Challenge live table read at SIF in 2019, and has also written the features Dodgeball, excuse me, Dodgers, Birth, and today's teleplay, 38 Minutes. Uh, she co-leads the Bigfoot Green Room with me. She is very helpful, uh, good <laughs> partner. Um, and she also teaches screenwriting at the at Gig Harbor's Women's Prison. She's going to be uh, getting feedback from Christopher Lockhart, who on our screen, I guess, is the bottom right. Um, Christopher Lockhart is the story editor at William Morris Endeavor. As an executive filmmaker and educator with over 30 years of industry experience, A-list actors go to Chris to vet scripts. Chris curates projects for actors like Denzel Washington and has read over 60,000 screenplays in the course of his career. I imagine there's a assistant with a ticker, just like ch -ch 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 -ch, uh, may have carpal tunnel syndrome at the end of this. Um, sorry, he, uh, he got a start at International Creative Management, ICM, as a script consultant for the legendary agent, Ed Lamato, who represented Mel Gibson, Richard Gere, Michelle Pfeiffer, Liam Neeson, and Robert Downey Jr. Chris later moved to William Morris Endeavor, now WME, uh, Chris branched into producing with his horror hit, The Collector, and its sequel, The Collection, which makes him, brings him close to my heart. He wrote and produced the award-winning documentary, Most Valuable Players, which was acquired by Oprah Winfrey Net for her network. As an educator, Chris lectures around the world on the craft and business of screenwriting. He is an adjunct professor at National University's Professional Screenwriting Program and taught at UCLA. His writing workshop, The Inside Pitch, was filmed and earned him an Emmy Award nomination. He lives in Beverly Hills, California, where you're joining us from, I imagine, uh, and has a 12-year-old son. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Thank you. Um, and before we get started, I'd like each of the act to go around and let each of the actors introduce themselves, tell them a little bit about themselves and who they're reading today. Let's start with, oh, I have the, what everyone else can see. Let's start with Krista. Hi, my name is Krista Wells. I'm reading the role of Grace today. And uh, Deborah. Uh, my name is Deborah Prawley, and I'm reading the role of Tess today. Jason. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Connolly, and I'm reading for the role of Alex. Uh, uh, David. Hi, I'm David Hogan. I'm reading Reese and William. And finally, Angela. I'm Angela DeMarco, and I'm reading Hannah. And just so everyone knows the the structure of of our broadcast today, I guess, is that uh, we're going to read a table read for about 25 or 30 minutes, and then there'll be about 30 minutes of feedback from uh, Chris, including uh, some feedback from the actors. So without further ado, and a big drink of water. 38 Minutes, a limited series for television written by Heather Pilder Olson, based on actual events. Episode one, Soldier and Spy. Interior apartment day. Tess, 75 and in the midst of a manic episode, applies far too much green eyeshadow as she gazes at herself in the bathroom mirror. She quickly lines up 20 lipsticks, one by one, along the edge of her sink. She looks at the photo of Sean Connery as James Bond taped to her wall. She's singing very loudly, belting out the theme from You Only Live Twice. This dream is for you, so pay the price. Make one dream come true, you only live twice. Tess kisses her fingers and plants the kiss in the photo of Sean Connery. She resumes getting ready, brushing her hair, making herself up as if it might be her last day on the planet. Interior airport, same time. 
Alex, 50, and fully in command, walks through the Honolulu airport carrying, the duffel ba- carrying a duffel bag. He's wearing fatigues and combat boots, moving through the terminal the same way he moved through the desert in Iraq. Focused. Determined. Always the Marine. His phone rings, and he sees his wife Sarah's name on the screen. Hey, baby. Yeah, looks like my flight's going to be on time. There's no response. Alex holds the phone away from his face, stares at it, and then tries again. Sarah, can you hear me? His phone buzzes and he looks at it. He looks around, seeing others getting messages on their phones, too. He sees the time, 8.07 a.m. Baby, did you get that alert? People are staring at their phones, confused. Some start to run. Some try frantically to dial out. Sarah, I don't know if you can hear me, but we need to act as if this is real. Get the kids. Get to safety. I'll call you as soon as I can. Interior, Tess's apartment. Tess's cell phone buzzes and she stares at it. She reads the words on the phone screen and looks concerned. She walks to her window and looks outside. We see a quiet street and the beach, palm trees and the ocean in the distance. Tess sets her phone down and resumes her singing. She selects one of the lipsticks from the edge of the sink and she she talks to her reflection. Well, this calls for a special lipstick. Let's go with uh, Rocket Red. Interior airport. Alex hears his cell phone buzz again and sees the words on his phone screen just as they are being announced overhead. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Interior airport, nearby terminal. Hannah, 37, gathering her her red hair into a ponytail and trying to regain her composure, sits down on the floor near a window and reaches into her tote bag. She takes out a bottle, bottle of Amaro, opens it. She takes a drink, and the strong, herbaceous liquor hits the back of her throat like a punch. She coughs and takes another drink. An older woman approaches her. This is Grace, 85, black, beautiful, self-assured, and full of life. This is how you're going to spend what could be the last moments of your life? Yes. Want to join me? Grace stares at her, and then she smiles. Hannah hands her the bottle, and Grace takes a drink. Let's keep going. Get to safer place. Hannah stands, and the two women walk quickly, following a crowd, moving toward an escalator. Grace takes a long drink. Amaro, that's original. Have you been to Italy? Yes, uh, twice. I love it there. Me too. I met my Giovanni in Florence. We were married for 55 years. He passed away last summer. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm not. We had a fantastic life. Three kids, five grandkids, four cats, and a python. God, I hated that snake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Hannah. I'm here on vacation from New York. Hello, Hannah. I'm Grace. I'm on vacation, too, from New York also. What the fuck is happening here? I mean, do you think this is real? I don't know. But I'm not quite ready to die yet. Not like this. Well, let's toast to the Big Apple. God, I hope we get to see it again. The women drink as they walk, and Hannah's phone buzzes again. The alert flashes across her screen. That painting on your tote bag? That's a Reese Wallace, isn't it? Yes. It is. He's my, well, we're. He's amazing. So talented. I'm a collector. I bought one of his pieces last year. Hangs in my bedroom. He's my boyfriend. I've been, uh, I've been trying to reach him. Oh, good God, woman. Keep trying. Try my phone. I'm getting a bit of a signal. Hannah takes Grace's phone and dials. The phone rings and rings. She tries texting instead. Reese, it's me, Hannah. I'm in Hawaii and there is a missile heading for the islands. I only have a few minutes. Please call me. She hangs up and Grace holds her hand. The women pass a large window and look out at a clear sunny day. Everything looks so idyllic outside. Inside, the panic increases. A family runs past the two women, children crying. 
The phone rings and Hannah answers. Relief spreads across her face and she closes her eyes. Hannah? <sighs> What's going on there? I just turned on the news. A, a missile is headed for the islands. They say it's not a drill. This can't be happening. I want you to know something. I love you. I, I love you. I love you. God, we've been so stupid. I love you. How can I help? I don't know. I mean, just, just stay on the phone with me, okay? Where are you? I'm in the airport. I met this amazing woman. She has one of your paintings. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Baby, you have to get to shelter. Go to a safe place. Do, do whatever you have to do. I'll be here. I am so sorry. I shouldn't have come here. Reese, I love... Reese? Reese, can you hear me? Hannah stares at the phone. The signal is gone. She can't hear his voice. She hangs up. The two women hold hands and walk toward a soldier. Let's try to survive this thing, shall we? Interior, Reese's studio, New York. Hannah? Hannah! He's lost her. He throws the phone down. He takes a can of red paint and throws it against the wall. It splatters, staying the white space like blood. He stares at it. Then he picks up a brush, paints on the wall, turning the splatter into something. He moves towards a huge canvas. It's gray and black and menacing. It's the best work he's done. It looks like a stormy sky ready to pour down rain. He takes the brush and paints a huge asymmetrical red heart in the center. He traces the line of the heart over and over again. Interior, Tessa's bathroom. Tess applies copious amounts of red blush to her cheeks with a large brush as she gazes at herself in the bathroom mirror. Her phone blasts the missile alert again and she stares at it. I knew it. Knew it. They've been watching and now they are pissed off at us and it's time. By God, it's time. It's not North Korea. That's what they want you to believe, but that's just a sham. It's Russia. The Russians are gonna blast us right off this planet. And I am gonna look like a million bucks. From Russia. She's moving a million miles an hour, organizing the shampoo bottles in the shower, moving them and reorganizing them again. She cleans the toilet. She's singing the theme from Russia with Love. My goodbye. Interior airport. Alex leads Grace and Hannah down a flight of stairs through a dimly lit hallway. The women are still holding hands. Alex is now doing his duty, a Marine completely focused on his task. He gently takes Grace's arm. This way, ladies. You'll be safe here. How much time do we have? until the missile hits. It takes about 20 minutes for a bomb to get from North Korea to us. We have 15 minutes. Holy fuck. Look, we're just in about the safest possible place. This airport was built for this. Follow me. Interior airport shelter. Alex leads the woman around a large room. There are four flights underground surrounded by thick walls. The room is austere and flooded with fluorescent lights. A few tables and chairs line the fall, far wall. A young Marine brings coffee and cups into the room. Alex talks with him. I'm going to go back upstairs to get more people. And you stay here. Keep folks calm. Talk to them. Alex touches the white plastic Timex watch on his wrist and sees the time, 8.15 a.m. Hannah looks around the room at, at the faces of the other people. She sees Alex twisting the watch on his wrist. There are nearly 100 in the room now, with more coming in. Everyone looks scared. A small child cries and his mother comforts him. A man gets a cup of coffee. He tips his red mega baseball cap to Grace. He is William, 70, smiling and sure he's right about everything. Yeah, this has to be a joke. A false alarm. But we're going to assume it's real. And with our president and North Korea's whack job of a leader, it certainly could be. Boys with toys. Trump is the greatest thing to happen to this country in years. I hope it is real. Then we can bomb the shit out of those Japs and they'll get what they deserve. Uh, sir, I won't argue with you because I know it won't do any good. <laughs> One small note of correction. People that live in Korea are called Koreans. The Japanese have nothing to do with this. Oh, well, aren't you the smart one? PhD in physics, so in fact, yes. Grace holds her cup of coffee in the air, making a toast. Here's to making America great again. 
The man glares at Grace and walks away. His face is red. He mm. keeps staring at her as he drinks his coffee. Mm. I love you, Grace. Let's mm. be friends forever. Deal. Hope forever is more than 10 minutes. Interior airport, upper terminal. Alex walks with purpose through the hallway. He stops to talk with a group gathered near the ticket counter. Folks, I'm here to get you to a safe place. Come with me and I'll take you to the shelter. He repeats his message to several other groups of Excuse people me. until he has found 25. His cell phone buzzes and he takes it out, out of his pocket to look at it. He sees a message from Sarah. Hey, baby, let me know how you're doing. The kids and I are in the shelter now, doing fine. Alex squeezes the phone and puts it back in his pocket. We see the briefest hint of emotion sweep across his face. And then he's back to steely focus. In charge, a small child tugs on his sleeve. Alex stops and squats down to be eye level with the kid, who is about five years old. The crowd stops to watch. Look, I'm going to do my best to make sure that you and your family are okay. I'm a Marine, and I know how to protect people. It's my job. You have my word on that. The boy smiles and seems completely confident. He takes Alex's hand and they walk on. The boy's mother wipes tears quickly from her cheeks. She carries a six-month-old baby. Do you know the song from Paw Patrol? You want to sing it together? The boy and the soldier launch into the theme from Paw Patrol. The mother is now weeping freely, gratefully. The crowd joins in and they walk into the underground shelter, singing loudly. Paw Patrol, Paw Patrol, whenever you're in trouble. Paw Patrol, Paw Patrol, we'll be there on the double. No jobs too big, no pups too small. Paw Patrol, we're on a roll. So here we go, Paw Patrol. Well, look mm -hmm. at this. That soldier knows what he's doing. Others in the room join in, glad for the distraction. William stands up and joins the song. He looks at Grace and she nods and smiles at him. Just about everyone in the room is singing now. Hannah doesn't know the words to the song, but she's smiling broadly. If we're going to go out, let's go out singing. Another soldier enters the room with snacks, bags of chip, chips, cookies, and candy bars. He places them on the table next to the coffee and looks around the room full of people singing. He joins them. The song ends and every, everyone in the room goes quiet. Everyone looks around at everyone else and the gravity of the situation sinks in again. The missile alert blasts over the sound system. People look at their watches and phones. Let's keep singing. Something everybody knows. Um, row, row, row your boat in a round. She looks at William and she nods at him. They divide the room into two groups. Grace takes the left side and he takes the right. She and her group begin. Row, 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 row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, row, merrily, row, merrily, row, merrily, row merrily, your boat gently down the stream. As the song continues, we move back and the room becomes smaller and smaller. We see it shrinking below us and we move straight up through the building, above the roof and into the clear blue sky. We see an ocean in the distance. We see the time on the screen, 8.20 a.m. Interior, Tess's apartment. Tess is now fully, glaringly made up, and her hair is up in a bun. She wears a gray pinstripe suit jacket and bright green harem pants. She looks radiant and insane. She walks quickly into her second bedroom and looks at her walls. They are covered floor to ceiling with maps and charts. She has post-it notes everywhere, and in the center of the back wall is the word Russia in huge red letters. Tacks with strings show paths on maps from Russia to other parts of the world. She moves close to the map of Hawaii. She puts her finger on it. Time. If they would listen to me, they would know. I call every single day. I've tried to explain, I've tried to warn them, but they just think I'm crazy. And maybe I am crazy, but I am also right. Putin is behind all of this. He knows what he's doing. Daniel Craig is good, but, but we need Sean Connery. Exterior, Honolulu Street. A father lifts up a sewer cover and looks down at, into the darkness. He looks at his little girl, eight years old and terrified, and motions for her to get into the sewer. Interior su sewer. The girl's older brother motions up to her. He holds her out in his arms. He holds out his arms. The girl is crying now. She moves toward the sewer and sits down, letting her legs dangle into the hole. Her brother reaches for her and lifts her down. Their dad moves toward them and then starts to lower himself down too. Interior, Tess's apartment. Tess, is, Tess watches the family getting into the sewer from her apartment window. She smiles and shakes her head. That's not gonna save you. Even if you survive the blast, you'll come up to a post-apocalyptic nightmare. 
nothing and no one will be here. It will just be ash and rubble as far as the eye can see. And the radiation will kill you after that. And that's a far worse way to go. No food, no water, nothing. You might survive a, a day. I'd rather be blown sky high. And I am ready. I am going to meet my maker and Sean Connery. I'll be his money penny in the sky. Tess marches back into her war room. She is triumphant. She is celebrating. She points to the sky. She sings loudly. Goldfinger, he's the man, the man with the Midas touch, a spider's touch. Such a cold finger beckons you to enter his world of sin. But don't go in. Interior airport. Hannah pours two cups of coffee. She walks over to where Grace sits and hands her a cup. She sits on the floor next to Grace. Best moment you can remember. Skydiving with Reese was pretty amazing. That was a good moment. It's like flying, a feeling of being totally free. I was terrified, but I jumped anyway. What about you? It might be right now. It might be not killing that guy who loves Trump, finding the humanity instead. He was good with row, row, row your boat? Yes, he was. I'm gonna go get him some coffee. Hannah crosses her legs and leans back against the wall, getting lost in more memories. Interior airport shelter. Grace watches Hannah, who is deep in thought. She takes a drink of coffee and Hannah comes back to the moment. You're thinking about him. Yeah, remembering some good times. I bet he's amazing in bed. <laughs> well, how did you know that? I'm an art collector. I've dated my share of artists. Anyone I know? Jackson Pollock? No fucking way. I really liked him Oof. in bed. I liked him in other places too, but I only spent a few days with him. I bet you have some stories. You have no idea. I should write a memoir. Mm -hmm. If we get out of here, I'll do it. I want to read it. You can join me on the book tour. Deal. Sign me up. You're in love with Reese, yes? Yes. But I've never said it out loud. Well, it's time. Grace hands Hannah her phone. By some stroke of luck, she has a signal. Hannah walks to the private corner of the room and dials. Reese answers right away. Hannah, are you okay? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, so far, we're, we're in the shelter under the airport. Supposedly we're safe here. Nothing's happened yet. Wouldn't the missile have struck by now if it was going to? I don't know. I won't feel safe until we know what's going on. It's weird. God, I am still wasting time, Reese. Baby. Let me talk. I never said it, and I should have, and I, I wanted to be with you the first day I met you, and I am so stubborn, and I'm stupid, and... It's, it's okay. I love you. I know, and you tell me all the time, and why do you put up with me? Because I love you. I like putting up with you. I am so sorry. I shouldn't have come here. I want you to come home. I'm scared. I've been scared my whole life. Hannah, are you crying? No, baby. Hannah is crying harder now. Grace looks over at her and smiles. All pretense is washed away. Emotions move through Hannah's whole body. It's okay. It's going to be okay. I'm right here. I love you. The phone goes dead. Reese. Hannah stares at the black screen and pushes buttons, trying to get Reese back. Alarms go off in the room and all over the airport. Hannah goes back to sit next to Grace. The women hold hands. Ray, Hannah looks around the room. Families hold their children tight. William looks scared now. For the first time, he puts his head in his hands. A Chinese family bows their head in silent prayer. Interior hallway. 
Alec steps out into the hallway and calls his wife as he walks. He moves quickly down the hall up the stairs. The phone goes to voicemail. Hey, baby. <clears throat> I'm okay. I'm getting more folks into the shelter. Look, stay where you are. And, and if this is it... He pauses. The alarms blaring make it hard to hear. Alex takes a deep breath, composing himself. He is fighting his emotions, trying hard to stay in control. If this is it, you'll be safe. Stick to the plan. I love you. I will always love you. He hangs up and walks up the last flight of stairs. He makes one more call. Interior, Tess's apartment. The phone rings and she stares at it. A landline rarely used. Hello? Mom? Can you hear me? Alex? Yeah. Yeah, it's me. Look, are, are you safe? Um, I'm fine. I'm fine. I, I, I know what's happening. I, I, I'm ready to meet my maker and Sean Connery. Can you, can you get down to the basement underground? seen you in a long time. I know. I, I never wanted them to take you away from me. I know, Mom. I, I wanted to be a good mom. I'm just not um, really equipped. Alex holds the phone away from his face. His eyes well up and then he fights the emotion. He clears his throat. I know you did the best you could. You're a good have you seen Goldfinger? I, I have some gold nail polish. It's called Tempting. Don't you just love the color names for nail polish? Some of them are so creative. My all-time favorite is from the Opie Sydney collection. Did you redo your nails? That's brilliant. Just brilliant. Cause do, do you get it? Do you get it? Did you redo your nails? I mean, that person who came up with that one deserves a medal. Mom. Uh -huh. Look, I need you to go downstairs. I want you to stay in the basement until this is over. Will you do that for me? Uh, I might need my advice, son. I, I, I have my war room ready. I can show them. I know it's Russia behind this. That missile is coming from Russia with love. Mom, please go downstairs. I'll call you again as soon as I can. S sir, yes, sir. I was a soldier too. I was good. I was, I was the top of my class. I know, Mom. I know. We, look, we might only have a few moments. Mom, please, go downstairs right now. I have to go check on my lasagna. I got to go, son. Bye. Tess hangs up and goes into the kitchen. She's vacillating somewhere between reality and the fantasies in her mind. She opens up the oven and looks at the lasagna bubbling. She takes it out and sets it on top of the stove. Oh, Sean Connery would love this. With a nice salad and a bottle of Chianti. Tess cuts a piece of lasagna and puts it on a plate. She sits down at her small kitchen table and stares at her food. She stares at the bottle of lithium next to her plate. She picks up the bottle and considers it. Sets it down. She picks it up again, opens it, and takes a pill. Interior airport shelter. Do you remember the songs we used to sing as kids in school? America the Beautiful. Ugh, God bless America. 50 nifty United States and 13 original colonies. Yes. We used to recite the Pledge of Allegiance every day. We did too. I don't think it's required in a lot of schools now, though. I used to feel like we were moving forward, trying to be what the world saw us to be, a beacon. And then when Obama got elected, I was thrilled. A black president, someone who represented me, finally. Real progress. I know the pendulum swings back and forth, but it's sure stuck in a weird place right now. So far to the right, we can't see straight. Yep. Reese and I have talked about moving somewhere else. Italy's lovely, but every country has its own set of problems. Once women are running things, 
it'll all get better. I like that idea. William slumps off his chair and falls to the floor. His body shakes with convulsions. Grace gets to her feet and walks quickly towards him. He's having a seizure. Can someone get me a sweater or jacket or something soft? Hannah takes off her cardigan and hands it to Grace, who places it under his head. She tilts his head back gently and holds it there. She talks to him softly. You're going to be okay. I'm here with you. Everything's going to be fine. Another woman kneels next to him and places a hand on his shoulder. This is Miley, 45, a nurse. A nurse. His convulsions begin to ease up and he looks at Grace. She smiles down at him and strokes his forehead gently. There now. Everything's okay. My husband had epilepsy. We managed it pretty well. William looks up at the woman. He's breathing calmly now. Just rest there. We've got time. Hannah looks at the clock on the wall. Alex looks at his watch. It's 8.26 a.m. Listen up. Look, I need everyone to remain calm. For the next few minutes, I need everyone to stay in this room. No bathroom breaks. We're in the safest possible place we can be right now. So let's get through this the best we can. Let's sit tight for a few minutes. Grace looks at the clock on the wall and then at Alex. His eyes meet hers. It's time. She stares at Alex and then closes her eyes. Grace holds William's hand. She reaches out to Hannah with her free hand and Hannah takes it. Please, please help us. Around the room, families hug their children. An older man puts his head between his knees. A few people follow his lead and do the same. Everyone is completely silent. End excerpt. Good job. Let's do it again. Start, just start from the top? Let's just start from the top and do it again. Uh, so, Heather, how did that feel? What, what did you think of, of uh, seeing it all read aloud? Um, it's great. I mean, I, I really appreciate what these actors bring to the table. And um, who it, it got me. <laughs> Got me a little choked up. You know, it's interesting because I wrote it originally a couple of years ago and with the recent election and the recent passing away of Sean Connery and all these things that just hit so much harder coincidentally right now. Um, it, it, uh, it was great. I, I, um, I, I didn't get a chance in the beginning, Arthur, to do a little pitch. So I, Oh, I, sorry. <laughs> I, I would like to just give a little background about this story and to let people know, especially that last year I did a table read when this script was written as a feature and Christopher Lockhart was on that panel. And he said to me, you know, this is a great idea. This is based on a true event. It's a compelling story, but it would be way better as a limited series. If you broke it into episodes where every episode was exactly 38 minutes long, and you examine this incident from different angles. And, uh, you know, I went home and I was digesting that and feeling like, man, I love it as a feature. I don't want to change it. I don't want to change it. But I kept hearing Christopher Lockhart's voice <laughs> saying it would be so much better as a series. And, and he was right. <laughs> so I rewrote it as a limited series, say six episodes, where each episode is taking a different look at this incident, which really happened on January 13th. 2018. And this first one, I just wanted to show real people in the midst of the crisis. I'd love to show an episode that's in the Pacific Command Center with, you know, the person that pushes the button. Um, there's so many different ways you could examine this um, and how it affected the people in Hawaii, because for them, the rest of us, I don't think could feel the weight of it, but for them, they really believed it was real and it took 38 minutes for them to get an alert that it was a false alarm. They really thought, you know, this is it, this might be it. And so I think that's a compelling idea for a series. So I just wanted to give that, to have the chance to have Christopher Lockhart see it again is amazing. And I'm super grateful for that. And um, I wanted you to know that I took your advice to heart. So I'd love to know what you think. <laughs> well, all right. Um... Thank you. You know, it's very brave to uh, to do this, and and uh, I thought the actors were great. I thought uh, you all did a really good job. Uh, I did read the the complete script, uh, so uh, you know I know what happens um, from beginning to end. And 
And I'll say that, you know, I, 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 will, I, I will still stand by um, my note that I think uh, the idea would make a, a, uh, a better limited series. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I mean, who knows what you might have done with it as a feature. Uh, it just feels like there's, there's so many stories to tell and uh, you can't possibly tell all of those stories in a feature, not with any sort of depth or substance, that's for sure. Um, so, so it was interesting to see it like this. And, and um, so I have some thoughts. And uh, first, let me just, uh, and Heather, I've given you feedback before, I guess, and you know I'm pretty direct. I don't pull any punches. Uh, and uh, but I hit with love I'm ready. and uh, all right. <laughs> and also let's keep in mind that uh, anything that I share here is my opinion. It is the opinion of one person only. And um, so, uh, all right. So um, I wrote down some things. I'm gonna, you know, just gonna have some notes here. So uh, I think that that in the script, you probably should um, just preface that this is based on a true story, uh, perhaps even explain just very briefly the idea that on January 20th, 2018, there was this event and blah, 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 blah. And, and you know, these are the people and these are some of the stories of those who are affected, that kind of thing. Remember, a pilot is very important because a pilot sets up your series. So it is possible that this episode may not be your pilot. Uh, you might actually write another episode that establishes the dilemma and the series better than this does perhaps. Um, it's safe to say that this is sort of an anthology series. It's all sort of based on, uh, because I'm assuming that these characters are not going to come back again. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong, but Maybe if yeah. we're not gonna see these characters again, then this is an anthology series. It's sort of based around a particular event and each episode will feature different characters, but all within this same scenario of this 30, how many minutes? 38. <laughs> yeah, 38 minutes. Um, uh, I would just be curious, so just in regards to research, what kind of research did you do for this? So did you actually talk to people? Uh, are, are, are you telling any real stories here? Yes, um, yes I, did, uh, I did do some. The, the idea originally came from a fellow filmmaker um, and the director of my movie, The River, Rick Walters, who uh, lived in Hawaii and knew people that had gone through this incident. So he had the idea, you know, what if, what would it be like to create a script around this? Cause that we hadn't seen that before. We also coincidentally had uh, filmmaker friends who made a documentary. And so they allowed us to see the rough cut of that where it was real stories of people and their experience as this occurred. And the idea for the mother and the son who were separated and had been estranged was came from a real story. And the first person that this son spoke to, he, you know, he called when he, this happened was his mom, who he hadn't spoken with in 20 years. And as a result of this incident in real life, these two people were reconnected. Um, there was another true story that I wanted to do another episode about of a woman who on January 13th, the day the missile alert went out, it was her 21st birthday. And her reaction when she heard this, you know, got this cell phone alert was to grab a bottle of champagne and go to the beach and go surfing. She thought, well, you know, if I'm gonna die. I'm gonna do what I wanna do. It's my birthday, this is it. I'm gonna get drunk and I'm gonna go to the beach. And so there, you know, there's so many different stories but some of these really did come from real life. And I watched a lot of news clips and read a ton of articles about the Pacific Command Center and what happened in that room. And, you know, the, the man who still to this day believes he did the right thing by issuing this alert. He heard a message that made him believe it was real. He lost his job as a result of that. He got all kinds of death threats. It was a big problem for him, but he believes if he hadn't done that and it had been real, it would have been far worse. So 
it's a, a feature film in that, by the way. I mean, yeah. that, that, that in of itself, you could, you could create an entire screenplay around that. And to me, that's actually very, very compelling. And that's, that's, that's part of a dramatist's job is to be able to seek out uh, the stories. You know, where, where are the stories? So for example, with all due respect to what you just pitched, the idea of a girl on her 21st birthday going to surf when she believes a missile is going to hit is not an interesting story to me. Okay. Um, that would be fine for a documentary for somebody to sit down and talk about that. But that to me is not a particularly compelling piece of television. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, I think what this pilot doesn't do well is it does not create the world for me. I don't really understand what's going on in this world. Mm -hmm. um, for example, we're in an airport. Where are the police? Mm -hmm. There's no police anywhere. You just, you know, you, you only have this guy. Um, where are the police? And uh, what is the media saying? So uh, are, are the media also fooled or have they done their due diligence? And is it, you know, uh, how much of this is like Halloween back in 1938 with, uh, uh, you know, Orson Welles? and the War of the Worlds, mm. uh, 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 how much of this dilemma is, uh, is affecting how many people? So, it, it, so is everybody in Honolulu believing that the missile is coming or only certain people? Um, you know, how come nobody's checking out like CNN on their phones or, uh, you know, like what's going on? So I have no sense of, of sort of the world within within Hawaii and sort of how how are the, really the only glimpse that we get is the dad and the sewer uh, mm -hmm. with the girl and that's it mm -hmm. so uh, so so that didn't work for me so you know I th and again you know maybe maybe that's not what this episode does maybe that's established in in another episode but I sort of feel like in the pilot that that's what the pilot is supposed to establish. Now, you know, you can just say, well, you know, Chris, this, this isn't actually the pilot. This is just what, this is like episode four. And I'd be like, okay, great. All right. <laughs> but, uh, but ultimately, I think that you need to establish that. Um, so uh, I also think you need to establish what, what the bomb will do. So is this, so like, will this bomb literally sink the island? So, you know, like, like will, will life completely cease to exist on that island? Or, you know, will it only kill X amount of people? You know, like the military always knows those things. Like if we drop this bomb, we're gonna, you know, there's gonna be X, X amount of casualties, X amount of collateral damage. But I, so, but I sort of feel like we, the audience need to understand what's, what's at stake. Um, so those are just some sort of, you know, just things that sort of came to my mind, just sort of uh, uh, generally speaking. Um, when I heard the pitch, and, and I believe that I also, uh, so you pitched this at one of the Seattle events, correct? I had, or, a, I had a table read of it last year when it was a feature script. All right, but, I remember hearing this somewhere. So, I mean, obviously I did because I gave you the notes. So was it the table read? But, but it wasn't the entire uh, script. It was maybe just like 10 pages or something, right? Yeah. Yes, it was an excerpt. Right. Yeah. right, yeah, because I remember Deborah's character. Um, all right, uh, um, and then you also had the pitch about, uh, it was like a prison pitch, right? Because prison pitch I, too. But that's right, oh, that's right. Yeah, that's great, I love that, okay, anyway. I divert. Let, let's 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 focus, focus. All right. So I heard that pitch, and I was like, "Wow, that's you know, like that's a really good pitch. I love this idea. I, I think it's a really compelling idea." And then you know what happens? And then you read the script, and 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 the reality is is that sometimes a pitch sounds really great. And then when you see it in its, in its actual format, because the pitch is not the actual format in which we're going to experience it, right? Mm -hmm. um, once that, 
that concept materializes within the dramatic format, now you're able to see some of the, the flaws perhaps that, that sounded so good in a two minute pitch that here now it's like, ooh, this is a little bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. So challenge number one for this concept is that there is no missile. There's no missile, right? And like, that's so cool. Like, we love that. But there's no missile. So we have a bunch of people sitting around in a fucking bomb shelter talking for 45 minutes. And we know that nothing's going to happen. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so if, if they were in the basement of the World Trade Tower, on 9-11, those conversations would be heartbreaking because we know exactly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But here you have the complete antithesis. There's no drama here. There's no tension because we know there is no bomb. We have superior position. Uh, it, 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 dramatic irony mm -hmm. is when the audience knows what the, what the characters don't know. So we know that there's no bomb coming and the characters are not in a particularly compelling situation. The script needs to put characters in situations that are dire in of themselves, separate of the impending bomb. Hmm. The bomb will exacerbate what's ever going on but they have to be in compelling situations. You can't have six episodes of a show where everybody's in a bomb shelter talking, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 so, and, and so here, you know, we have, it's just, it, it almost feels theatrical. It almost feels like a play. Um, with all due respect, this isn't a bad thing, but it feels like this could have been written for like Playhouse 90 back in 19... You know, sixty-three. Rather than, I mean, you watch TV today. You you see TV, mm -hmm. right? It's crazy shit going on, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know. So here, you're trying to be more thoughtful, maybe a little existential. Um, you know, I'm I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but there's a bomb heading to fucking Honolulu, and these people are sitting around, you know talking about who they screwed, I don't know if that's really compelling television. As a documentary, yeah, sure. You know, to actually hear real life people sitting down and telling their stories. But as TV, six episodes, um, you know, I, I, I question um, it's, uh, it's, its effectiveness. Because ultimately, look, you know, drama is about, well, this is a character piece, right? I mean, you know, that's what these pages are. You're, you're, you're exploring characters. Mm -hmm. in, in my opinion, characters in drama are explored by the choices they make, because mm -hmm. it is the choices that they make that reveal to us who they are. Monologues do not create characters in drama. You know, quirkiness like Sean Connery and the hundred vials of lipstick, you know, great, great stuff, good stuff to sort of color and texturize. But ultimately, that's not what creates character in drama. This is why characters have to do things in drama. They have to be active. They have to do something because the choices that they make is what creates character. Let me just go off the beaten path a second. I'm just give you an example. Let's say I'm walking down the street and I see on the sidewalk a wallet filled with hundred dollar bills. The choice that I make will determine the kind of character I am. If I take that wallet over to the police station, I'm one kind of character. If I keep the wallet to myself, I'm another kind of character. 
If I take half the money out of the wallet and leave the other half behind, I'm another kind of character. There's all different kinds of choices that I could make. And each of those individual choices will reveal the character that I am. That's drama. That's how you reveal character in drama. And so Alex, for example, he's really not doing all that much, right? I mean, you know, there's, he's just, he's just sort of escorting people down into the basement. Now, what if his daughter were at home having an epileptic seizure and, you know, he has to make a choice. Do I stay here and help all these people or get back to my daughter? Now you have a choice to make. Now you create character. So I think part of what you tried to do here was that you tried to be true to these stories. Again, like the 21 year old who's gonna drink champagne on the beach instead of dramatizing. That's what you really wanted to do. And I mean, that's really what you need to do, right? Is that you need to dramatize a little bit. Look, you know, I'm not saying that you have to turn this into lethal weapon. That's not what I'm saying. But you need to find more compelling situations in which to explore the characters. Mm -hmm. that right? makes, yeah, that makes total sense. That's a and, you know, using, using the idea of this missile. Because ultimately, you know, we know that there isn't going to be a missile. Right. So, so to create situations for care, because right now, you know, we're just sort of sitting around and we're just, you know, it's like this, this isn't a story where we can say, you know, you know, what are you doing? There's a missile coming. There's a missile coming. Um, because we know that there isn't a missile coming and the characters aren't really doing anything. They're, they're doing exactly what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's not good drama. You want the characters to be doing exactly what they shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good drama. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, again, this is like, this is just the worst idea ever. I, I, I'm just, I'm like, I'm just talking off the top of my head. Uh, uh, I, you know, like, let's say that there's like, like there's a kidnapper who, who, who kidnapped a child and with, with, with 30, how many minutes left? With, uh, 38. With, thir with 38 minutes left, he has a change of conscience and decides that he, that, that, that he wants to reunite that child with, with his parents before they all die. And now he's got to get back there within 38 minutes. Yeah. I know, again. You know, that's like, you know, like that's a very, very different tone, but you know something that's a little more compelling, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. and so, so that's, that's, that's the way you need to be thinking here. Okay. Because ultimately there's no bomb coming. And so what we want is like, you know, you, you want the audience to be yelling at the characters, no, don't do that because there's no bomb coming. Like you have a character who's going to kill herself because she doesn't, you know, want to burn up. And, and you're like, no, 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 there's no bomb coming. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's, that's, that's the emotion. That's the tension that you need to elicit from this kind of scenario. Now, again, you know, clearly you have a very you know, a, a very sort of gentle uh, uh, story here. And, 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 you know, I'm going to the extreme with my examples, but I'm doing that to make a point. Yeah, no, it's so, a great point. It's a great point. It, it gives me a ton of ideas. And I love the idea of taking some of the stuff here and not making it the pilot. This is later, this is another angle. This is something, you know, we could take elements of this that work, but I love that. I, the the tone that I've been thinking about, and if I could pick one series to convey that sense of just like utter, you know, any minute everything's going to be total destruction is uh, Chernobyl, and it's the opposite. Like you said, we know that's going to be a disaster. We know that impending disaster is coming. So how do you create that feeling when this there is no missile, like you're saying? That's that's so, right. So, so you have to do it through the individual stories. Yeah. So, so there has to be uh, 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 tension and very high stakes 
in the individual stories that you're creating mm -hmm. and that and 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 that there is dramatic irony for us but also just general irony in the fact that these characters are making decisions that could potentially destroy their life when in theory there's nothing life threatening happening yep that's um, great that's a great piece of advice i yeah um, I so need to me, you know, that, that, that was the central flaw of this because mm -hmm. I'm reading it and I'm like, there's no tension here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, like everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing and sort of, you know, with all due respect, you know, it kind of felt a little bit like, you know, it was the love boat with a missile about to hit it, you know? And, 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 you know, so we just have like these night, you know, like you can see it, da, 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 you know, like Priscilla Presley's gonna play uh, uh, that character and, you know, Robert Luke, you know, Robert Goulet's gonna play the old man and, you know, and, 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 uh, and um, you know, and sort of everything gets wrapped up kind of, you know, nice and neat. Um, I'm not even sure that you should tell more than one story mm -hmm. uh, because then you end up really sort of not being able to, to um, drill down, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? You yep. know, because here you've got all these characters and you sort of have to go back and forth. And then we just get sort of all these nice little like, you know, love boat um, resolutions where, you know, you could really, um, concentrate on one story and it's possible that those stories uh, interrelate in in other episodes so like yeah. you know like the kidnapper could run past uh you know like deborah's house as she's putting on her lipstick or something you know um but um uh, and and even deborah's story and i'm sorry i'm saying deborah but i forgot the yeah. character's name what was yeah. the character's name Tess. Tess, okay. Sorry, Deborah. Deborah, you did such a good job. You became Tess for me. <laughs> um, yes. And, um, you know, like, like, so you, you have Tess and, and, um, you know, you could potentially put her in a more interesting situation. Like if, she, like, if she kind of thinks that she's a spy and, a missile's coming, what might she do? I, you know, I mean, like, who might she try to see? Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what craziness might she try to invoke that could be quite dangerous, perhaps, mm -hmm. for other people and for herself, maybe? I don't know. But, um, you know, but to just have her talking to a mirror, um, I, I, again, look, you know, like, I'm not saying that that is a, a bad, I just don't think it was the best choice given the scenario at hand. And as a pilot, a pilot that you would potentially want to sell, um, I think a lot of people in my position around town would read the script and say, this is a play. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would say, wow, like, you know, this is a really interesting scenario, but I don't believe that the script really exploits it to its you know, fullest, uh, fullest degree. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I'm thinking, you know, that you say all this less love boat, more homeland <laughs> needs to be like, amp up. I mean, it, it's a, it, 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 I want it to feel, I want, I love that by the way. Good for you. Yes. <laughs> I want people to feel the weight of what's happening because people there really did believe that this was it, right? You've got 20 minutes to live. Right. What are you going to do? That's and right. Was, and from what I understand, the level of destruction would have been s similar to what happened in Hiroshima, like complete devastation, hundreds of thousands of people dead. I mean, massive, you know, yeah. nothing left. So, uh, and, yeah. and, you know, and, and again, this is sort of, you know, this is this is a challenge, right? Because if people really believe that they're going to die in 20 some odd minutes, mm -hmm. um, you know, like maybe you really will go with a bottle of champagne and surf. 
you know, so, so, so that's why you need to create scenarios that are going to be believable mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and dire that, that, oh my God, you know something? Yes, I've got, you know, 38 minutes left to live. Uh, I am not going to pop a beer and flip burgers. I have to do this. Mm -hmm. And again, you still have to think that all the way through because, because ultimately for this character, this is always an issue with certain kinds of scripts when, when, when the stakes for, for the character, for what he's trying to do um, are, are outmatched by something else, right? So, you know, you have a character, I wanna to try to say this with clarity. You have a character who's trying to complete a goal within these 38 minutes, but ultimately the character knows that he's going to die. Mm -hmm. And we know the characters go, you know, like, let's just pretend, you know, and that, and that, and that, you know, we know that the character knows that he thinks he's going to die. So whatever he's doing has to be like, like, it has to be worse than death for him. Right. Meaning yeah. that, you know, like, like, like he has to complete this because, you know, his, his life will have no meaning uh, you know, like, because otherwise we're just going to say, why is this character running all over town? He's only going to be dead in 20 minutes anyway, or at least he thinks he's going to be dead in 20 minutes. Right. Um, so you have to create a scenario for the character from that point of view, but mm -hmm. also take into account that we know that the character isn't going to die. So you have to play this from, you know, like with like two hands, yep. here, which is yep. not easy. Yeah, the scene, do you remember the scene in Almost Famous where they're on the airplane and they're in the turbulence and they think they're going to die and they start confessing everything. I slept with your wife. I did this. I did all that. That that in that moment, it was the same kind of thing. They they thought this was it. So I'm going to tell the truth. Right. I'm going to propose to somebody. I'm going to confess, whatever it is. So there's things like, you know, I think I could borrow from that as well. Um, this is great. This is super helpful. <laughs> well, again, it's, it's just, it's very tricky, you know, yeah. it's so, so again, it's, it, it's, I heard the pitch and I was like, yeah, that's great. I love that, you know, uh, and then, and then you read the script and then you see what the challenges are in that pitch that I did not foresee. Yeah. And um, and this is why I always say and this is why, by the way, I love to do things like this, because, you know, I've been doing this for 25 plus years and 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 I learn stuff all the time. Yep. I learn stuff all the time. And so this yep. is why then when I hear a pitch like this again in the future, I'll put the brakes on and, and you know, I'll start to ask the writer those questions. Like if like if I were really good at what I did, I would have asked you these questions in the pitch rather than now but well, i'm still learning too you know i'm 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 still evolving which is why i still keep my job which is why i love what i do because i keep learning things all the time so thank you for teaching me um but 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 yeah it's tricky this this is this is a tricky concept to pull off mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but now i mean i have some great ideas thanks to you by 2022 it's going to be amazing I come back next year it'll be like okay now now we're getting somewhere so i'll be I there really, in person too i hope yeah i hope so i i really appreciate this it, it's awesome to have this feel like this is a project that's going through this great phase of development and i i agree i mean every time i tell somebody about the idea you can see how it sparks them right people remember this it was a real incident it's compelling so now I just have to execute it in the right way. So thank you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, with this break, I want to cut in with one question and then I want to ask the actors uh, to give some thoughts on the script as well. But one of the things that you mentioned, Chris, earlier is that if this was, you know, episode uh, four as opposed to the pilot, it'd be different. And one of the challenges that uh, one has with writing a pilot, whether it's a 38 minute pilot or a, a long pilot, is all the world setup that you have to do in, in, in addition to telling a, a story. Um, in, in that sense, um, is there a reason to write like what an average episode is? Like, for example, if this was an average episode as opposed to the one where you have to set up a lot of those uh, world aspects because it's kind of a different 
lift. Does that make sense? My question makes sense. You were asking that to the actors, correct? No, well, I'm asking. I'm at. Well, I'm asking you first before I go to the oh, actors. Is is oh, oh, is oh. is well, if I wasn't you're really if paying you... attention to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you're in a situation like this where you're you have a difference between the pilot and what an every episode is kind of like, what is the process for uh, showing that uh, in your writing? So you're saying that because this is an anthology series and and, and that and. The, and that this episode will be different than other episodes. So, like the in the pilot, she's going to need to set up a lot of the world building that you were you were just okay, you were referencing, correct. dealing with yes. Hawaii and all all of those pieces. But then later on, all the additional episodes will be uh, more character driven and will not need to do nearly as much setup. So, is there a way to easily show that uh, in in whatever materials that she provides? Like this is what a typical episode looks like, but I'll also need to do this in the pilot. Right. Well, I mean, it, you know, it, it, the first thing I would say is that she should do it in the pilot, right? And right. so then, and, and and so then, that's what she should be presenting to people, and and, um, and you know, this is a form here where it's educational and it doesn't matter. But if this script came to me through other channels at my office, I would be like, you know, I don't really know what's going on in this thing, you know, like all that much. Um, and um, so, th so her job is to is to establish as much as she needs to in the pilot. She does not necessarily need to establish everything. You can peel stuff off like an onion and and uh, you know add it to subsequent episodes. Um, but if this were the pilot, then 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 yes, she should have some kind of supplement, um, which which she does have, I saw it, it was, you know, like a, a one page pitch document, you know, like yeah. a pitch deck, mm -hmm. so to speak. And, um, and uh, she could perhaps devote a few lines to sort of what, what, what the panic actually looked like. So we have an idea of it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Deborah, uh, Tess has yes. been brought up and your name has been invoked many times in this conversation. <laughs> so I think it's most appropriate to ask uh, uh, your thoughts or what, what you'd like, anything you'd like to share. Yeah, I, well, first of all, um, Heather, thank you for finally casting me in something age appropriate because uh, I really am 75. I just look great. Um, but no, okay. I, I, I just had a blast reading it. I thought it was super interesting. Um, and I used to work a little bit in um, mental health care. That was my first life. Um, and having worked with, I, I'm assuming that there's a level of like paranoid schizophrenia or something going on here. I um, think she's bipolar. Yeah, or bipolar. So she's in a real manic phase and stuff. But I like the fact that um, she's very manic -y until she gets this call that that jar, you know, that uh, jars her. And I've been around patients that have done that where they're spinning or paranoid but then one thing will like cut through the noise mm -hmm. and kind of stop everything for a minute so I, I, for me that was a real interesting moment for her with with her with her son and then and then spiraling into other things oh i have dinner oh i have you know so i i just i just enjoyed learning all the songs honestly i, I didn't i didn't know all those uh james bond songs so now i've got Got a little repertoire. Yeah. I'm a huge, I'm a huge James Bond fan, so that was my own. You know, I want to put this in there, and Sean Connery in particular is my favorite. And then my inspiration for Tess very, came very much from Carrie Matheson, uh, the character in Homeland, who is this brilliant, incredible, you know, spy who is also bipolar. And how, I mean, I just think that is such a fascinating combination. And so to take someone like that and make her, you know, this is now she's in her 60s or 70s. What has her life been like? What mm -hmm. if she lost her child? What if all these things happen? Mm -hmm. You know, anyway. Yeah. yeah, so. By the way, just as a nitpicky note, um, I would avoid using the word insane. Mm, okay. Yeah. Great, thanks, Deborah. We sure. appreciate it. And great job today. Uh, Jason. <laughs> Any thoughts? Yes. Um, thank you for having me. And I, I own every episode of The Love Boat. 
on DVD. <laughs> um, do you really? I, conf- I, I really do. <laughs> I I like, sometimes I like happy little, you know, with a big bow kind of stories. Sure. Uh, sure. You know, Hallmark Channel Christmas movies, because it's that season. Uh, I do enjoy those. Uh, I do, uh, I'm just curious. So I'm very grateful to be a part of this conversation because this is really very insightful for me. And I think my question to you, Heather, is did you perhaps feel, I'm going to be dramatic, shackled perhaps by trying to be historically accurate to the situation? Because it, when I was, re- I've, I read the whole, you know, the segments that you gave to us and it was, you know, um, I really enjoyed it, but hearing some perspectives of how we can, you know, really push that out is very exciting to me. When when does the trying to be historically accurate then turn into inspired by true events? It, well, how do you a, straddle that fence? Yeah, see, that's a great question, and Christopher can probably answer that far better than I can. But a show that has me thinking in those lines that I just watched and just love, like watched every episode of all the seasons so far as Peaky Blinders, where they took, you know, based on a a real period in history, a real gang that existed in England. And that, but then they just went ballistic with it quite literally. And it's not historically accurate. They created these incredible characters. And so it, it seems like there's room to do something like this. Like here's a backdrop of a real incident and then go way deeper and way bigger with the drama like Christopher's saying that it, it would be a much better show so yeah you know you look you can't change the historical facts but you can certainly fictionalize what happened with within those historical facts right uh, I am certainly uh, I always say if you know you want to portray history make a documentary Mm-hmm. And uh, that doesn't mean that you should be irresponsible. Just a very quick story. When I first started at ICM, um, Denzel was hovering around a project called The Hurricane. And a uh, true story about uh, Reuben Hurricane Carter, a boxer. Uh, and I just thought that the script, which really stayed very close to uh, the actual events, wasn't particularly dramatic. For example, I was like, where is Denzel in the final sequence? Like he needs to be in the courtroom and he needs to make a big speech because that's how he's gonna get his Oscar nomination. And the producers were like, well, that didn't happen. You know, (laughs) Ruben was actually at the jail and he had his phone to his ear. And after the trial, his lawyers called him. And I was like, well, that sucks. And so I wrote up all of these notes. They eventually implemented quite a few of them. And when the movie was released, the backlash against the film because of the historical inaccuracies was so controversial that many people believe that Denzel did not win his most deserving Oscar that year because of that controversy. Mm. Oh, oh well. <laughs> and, and and so, um, but still, I still, I. I still stand by the fact that if you're a dramatist, dramatize. Yep. Yep. No, I I think that's, that's absolutely, I mean, it's like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to start from scratch. This is such great advice. And when I think about the shows that I'm watching right now and how compelling they are, you know, exactly. I mean, you don't see with, again, all due respect, you don't see this kind of thing on TV anymore, anymore. Right. You know, everything is so like bombastic and, you know, in your face and sort of crazy. And look, I'm not saying that, you know, this isn't refreshing, Mm -hmm. but, but, but look, the truth of the matter is, is, you know, if we're just going to talk like uh, reality and, and TV pilots, uh, uh, if you're a writer who has never worked in TV before uh, and uh, you don't have a couple of big feature films under your belt. The odds of you selling a pilot are literally slim to none. It's like winning the Powerball. So why write? I'll tell you why. Because what you want to do is get staffed on a show. That's believable. And so what you need to do is write a crazy, insane, balls to the wall pilot that people read and go, holy shit, this thing is 
amazing. I want her on our staff. With all due respect, and again, I'm just giving you tough love. Mm -hmm. This pilot will not accomplish that for you. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I believe that. I believe that now more than ever. <laughs> Good, because that's what this process is about, right? Yeah, no, it's super, it's super helpful. It's super helpful just to hear it out loud. And it's super helpful to have someone of your caliber giving this. Eh, whatever, you know, listen, well, I know the work. I, I, I have been on that side many, many times. Yeah. I know the words are painful. I know all of this. It's like trying to pass a kidney stone when you hear this kind of thing. Um, but ultimately, you know, once you pass that stone, you know, you're ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> you're a well, new person. On, on that beautiful analogy, uh, uh, Angela, can we have, do you have any thoughts? I, I, well, I had a, that was the best transition I had. Arthur, I, I, no kidney stones. I'm good. I, I, I'm good. She's got, she's got a great urinary tract. Yeah, it's okay. rocking. Thanks. I, did, I had water. I had Perrier. Come on. Um, no, I think just for me, the only thing, and, and Christopher touched on it a little bit, Heather, was that, uh, and I must have lost. I didn't know that uh, you wanted this as a limited series. So, you know, and I hear you talking about Homeland, which obviously is not limited. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we have Claire Dane's character, but then we have all these other characters. But I think if you want a limited series, you know, what comes to mind, you know, I think of like Broadchurch, where you have these two detectives, you have an inciting incident of the first season, and they're ultimately the ones finding out what's going on and all the other characters are these side characters mm -hmm. it felt like everyone was a lead in this mm -hmm. so i was i was with christopher in that it was um although it was great for us as actors like oh sweet we each get a pretty cool role to bring to life that um no offense to me and krista but i was like why why what's going why do we need to follow these two women mm -hmm. uh, it seemed like it was there for um uh to have a, a racial moment between the William character. And I was like, so I wasn't sure what that was about. And then, you know, being very drawn to Tess's story, uh, which is very disconnected from what's actually happening other than her son is there. Mm -hmm. But if this is really about what was happening on the Island, I guess I was like, so why are we bringing her in? And mm -hmm. I know if it's limited, you know, mm -hmm. six episodes, I'm like, Oh, shit okay heather uh you know like that's to me that's a lot so i'd almost like for me see you like c cutting half of these people out yep no, uh, I, yeah yeah Definitely. i mean only if you're really thinking limited and like christopher was saying and just of my friends who have had shows picked up that it's yeah they were staff first and it's mm -hmm. like so much harder than all of us making our indie features or uh, our shorts but nobody's done this. So when I remember when you first sent me the script, I was like, this is so, I was with how Christopher was with that first uh, table read that you did, mm -hmm. uh, which I missed. So mm -hmm. I remember when you circle back, we're like, Hey, could you do this for the film summit? Um, shit. I remember getting that alert. You mm -hmm. know, I remember this, but, mm -hmm. but because Christopher's right in that, and we all know there was no missile. I do think um, I had a friend who was there, you know, mm -hmm. so we could talk, but it's like, I do think speaking just of Hannah, uh, I could see if Hannah stayed, like she should be like freaking out, you yeah. know, not making friends. Right. Like, this right. is like, you know, I don't know how you guys feel, but this whole year I have been waiting for alerts from this maniac, um, nervous for my life. Mm -hmm. my friends' lives, my loved ones' lives, my students' lives. So it's like that kind of thing. What would we all do? And I think we've all kind of thought those things. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah, you know, you know uh, uh, I agree with Angela. And, and um, not just in regards to Tess, but also in regards to the Maniac. Um, and by the way, just another like month and a half, right? So just, you know, hang tight, all right? Um, so yeah, but it's like, you know, I was waiting for Tess to like load a friggin' shotgun and head off to the Russian embassy. And then her son is calling her and she's like, don't worry about it. I'm taking care of everything. I'm going down there now. And he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know? And, and, and again, it's like, you know, he's like 
pulling people and just really like kicking people's asses, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, those are the things that I kept waiting for. Uh, and, uh, you know, cause like, I would have loved that, you know, mm -hmm. um, like, you know, activate these characters, right? Activate them, get them to do something, set out to do something because of the missile. Yeah. Right. Yep. And then of course, you know, the idea that when it's revealed that there is no missile, that's also a tricky part for you as the writer, because that has to be a moment that shatters the characters. Yeah. It has to shatter them. And people, right? people, when that happened, people were so angry. I mean, they really did. Mm -hmm. They made death threats against the guy that put the alert out. They were, you know, pounding on the doors of the offices. And I mean, it was, it, yeah, it was. So that could be something that you show as well. How do you, if you really thought you were going to die and then you got this, oh, sorry, <laughs> we made a mistake. You did all these things and now it's not actually over. Then what do you do? Right. So, you know, it, it changed people's lives because the emotion and the stakes were so dire and then they weren't. Mm -hmm. And right. that, you know, that, that is something we haven't seen a lot of in terms of actual uh, real events before either. So. And you know, Heather, uh, I understand the, I understand the anthology approach and I like it, uh, but there's also another way that you can approach the story, right? Which is that you can actually tell this as if it is um, a feature film, uh, but you do it in, let's say eight, you know, eight or 10 episodes. Mm -hmm. um, so you can have Tess's story can, can mm -hmm. run from episode one all the way to episode 10 yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. um, so you could also write a pilot like that. And let me just, just give you a little sort of inside scoop on this, which is that the, the one thing that's great about a pilot is that you don't have to end a pilot. Yeah, you have to end it, but you don't have to resolve things, right? right? Like in screenplay, you have to resolve things. Right. And you, you know, and in a pilot, you don't. You just have to sort of end where it is satisfying that, you know, certain story elements perhaps are tied up, but larger story elements will be continued through the season as, as, as arcs. That's actually with all, you know, sort of, uh, uh, it's easier to do. Now, you know, again, I use that loosely, but it's easier to do that because now, like, you don't have to worry about how to end it. Imagine if you didn't have to end this episode with like all those pat little things and, you know, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like if you actually had time to sort of build to that, but didn't have to, sort of just come to those sort of packed resolutions in this pilot, you would have, it, it would have served your writing better. Yep. yep. Yeah. So I often say it's like, it's like you can tell often in a pilot that writers are writing themselves into corners in these pilots. They often don't have a clue what the next episode is going to look like or what the, you know, or how the series is going to end. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've read three or four episodes of a series and often my notes are, listen, take this amazing set piece from episode two and this amazing set piece from episode four and th throw them in the pilot, mm -hmm. throw everything into the pilot because it's all you got to sell. Yeah. Right. So you, you know, so you just put, everything into it and then you don't really have to worry about how how you're going to resolve it because that's going to happen at the end of the series yeah okay before we get to our resolution i i, I want i really want to touch so on grace because we have not yet spoken with krista i'm sorry mm -hmm. krista um uh, we saved the best for last <laughs> that's exactly right so do you have any thoughts or um uh comments okay. on the script uh, thank you for the opportunity. I, and just, I'm just honored to be a part of this. I was a last minute ad. Um, 
but no, I think you did something really wonderful. And I think the feedback is incredible. And yeah, rip it all up and start all over again. It's just like life, right? Yep. So I just learned a lot. I really enjoy the character. It was, you know, like Angela said, as an actor, it's fun to have a, you know, a tasty role that you get to play with. And that was fun for me. So thank you for having me. Really, I don't have any expertise to add to this opportunity that you guys have given me though. Thank you. Thank but you. you can you can start our wrap up. So is there any way that anyone can uh, get in touch with you or someone wants to hire you? How would they how would they do that? Yeah, I'm with Big Fish Northwest Talent. So you can always get a hold of agent Melissa Baldo Baldoff. So there's where I'm at. <laughs> Great. Angela, how would we get a hold of you? Or, or is there anything you would like to promote potentially? Uh, yeah. I mean, you guys can stalk me on the IMDB. Uh, you can check us out on mightytripod.com. Uh, and, you know, yeah, we'll work for nachos. <laughs> Great. Uh, Jason, good change of background. I think you're ready for Thank this you. moment. Thank you. I am ready for this moment. We're so excited. Our film, They Reach, just released in North America. So uh, it's been a long time coming. So please check us out. We're available physical discs in Walmart. And you get the Blu-ray that has a behind-the-scenes featurette. And it's also available on these outlets. Awesome. And so, yeah, and we're very excited about it. And if you need to get a hold of me, my agent is Tammy Wakasuki with All About You. You can also reach me on Facebook or on Instagram, Jason on location. Great. Thanks, Jason. Deborah, how, how can we reach you? Wow. I'm, you know, standing on a lot of corners, probably come on by. No, I'm with the actors group with Jamie and them. And um, yeah, I, that's, that's, and I, the only thing I'm promoting right now is that I'm a really bad homeschooler to my middle school son and my high school daughter. So that's all I can say right now is I'm just, as a matter of fact, I think there was screaming going on at some point while I was down here. I could just barely hear it. So when I leave here, I'm going to go up and see what sort of tornado went through my house while this went on. But anyway. Great. Well, I hope that your house survives. I hope it was a false alarm 38 minutes later. Um, Chris, how can people get a hold of you? Um, well, I, uh, if you I want have, them to get a hold of you. Well, I have a Facebook group. I, yes. um, and Super fun. Some of you are on it. Uh, it's called the Inside Pitch. It's uh, so you can just seek it out if you're on Facebook. The Inside Pitch. Yeah, just the Inside Pitch. Great. Awesome. Yeah, I'm that, not very good at promoting. That's totally fine. Heather, how about you? How can people get a hold of you? Uh, I have a website that is heatherpilderolson.com. You can see examples of my work. Um, our movie, The River, was just screening in the Seattle Film Summit. You can still see it tonight oh. or midnight in the Studio City Film Festival. Uh, just go online and you'll, you'll find it there. And it'll be coming up in some other festivals as well. And uh, yeah, Arthur and I co-lead The Green Room. If you're a screenwriter and you'd like to join us next year, we're taking applications opening up again in December. Great. And I'm Arthur Rance McNally. You can see my work at decodedfilms.com. And I think we have like two minutes left and I don't want to kill Todd. So I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Christopher.